Good afternoon, everybody, and, and welcome to our third weekly presentation on the subject of, of sexual abuse and harassment in schools. Um, today's session is going to be about sexual exploitation. Um, and uh, before we, we, we launch into it, we, we have a, a, yeah, a range of, of excellent speakers here today, and um, I just want to go through the domestics so that um, you know how this session is going to work. So it's a webinar. There are lots of you out there listening in and, and thank you all for giving your time up to date to listen in. Um, so you won't be able to be heard. So if you speak, we won't be able to hear you. But if you have a question, then please put them in the chat and, um, and then we will ask them to the speakers and the panel at the end as we go through. I mean, obviously there are a lot of you, so we're not going to be able to answer all the questions, but we will try to come back to everybody after the event if we don't if we don't get to them. Um, what I will do is um, introduce speakers in turn. There'll be a short time for questions after each session and then a panel at the end with all of us at the session to answer questions. Um, at the end of the event, you'll receive um, the the slides and any other useful information that's discussed in the sessions today. There'll also be a, a short evaluation sheet for you to complete that will come up on your screen at the end of the session. Um, and the session will be recorded and published on our colleagues, the, the PHSE Association's website, along with all the papers. So, um, so don't worry if there's something you've forgotten to write down, you will get all of this at the end. OK, so without any further ado, I would like to give a warm welcome to our first speaker, Dr Helen Beckett. Helen is a director of Safer Young Lives Research Centre and a reader in child protection and children's rights at the University of Bedfordshire. Thank you, Helen. Thank you, Paula, and it's lovely to be with you all today. I'm going to kick off today's webinar um, just by thinking a little bit of what do we mean when we talk about um, child sexual exploitation and I will use the shorthand CSE throughout because otherwise it's a little bit of a mouthful. Um, what we think about, what we know about it and then I'm just going to end with a few thoughts of what we have learned from young people in our research about how we educate around these issues. So just to start off, we will start off by taking a look at the definition of child sexual exploitation. A very good place to start. I feel as if I'm about to break into song, as I say, uh, a very good place to start. Child sexual exploitation is defined as a form of child sexual abuse. And first and foremost, that's really important to remember because we can get caught up in definitions and is it this or is it that? But actually it is a form of child sexual abuse. And so all of your policies and procedures for responding to child sexual abuse generally also think about, also cover how we respond to child sexual exploitation. Now, what distinguishes sexual exploitation from other forms of child sexual abuse is primarily the presence of exchange. And as we can see here in the definition, child sexual exploitation occurs when an individual or a group takes advantage of an imbalance of power to coerce, manipulate or deceive a child or young person under the age of 18 into sexual activity. It's a bit of a mouthful, isn't it? Here's where we get to the critical bit. In exchange for either something the victim needs or wants and or the financial advantage or increased status of the perpetrator or facilitator. So the exchange can be about the young person getting something in return as part of the abusive encounter or and it can be that someone else is, is gaining instead of the young person or also alongside the young person. And that's some of the things we're going to think about today, about how does this concept of exchange make this potentially a particularly tricky form of child sexual abuse um, to think around. As you can see in the definition here, um, CSE can occur even if the sexual activity appears consensual. That could be to the child or it could be to outsiders that it appears consensual. And it also notes here that it doesn't always involve physical contact. It can also occur through the use of technology. And it will come as no surprise to you all to hear that increasingly in recent years, we are seeing more and more um, of it occurring online or certainly involving some form of online element. 
So today's session is about CSE, but I would be absolutely remiss if I didn't just take a second to think about the context in which CSE sits. And actually all the attention that there has been on CSE in recent years has sometimes kind of obscured attention on other forms of sexual abuse. And it's really important that we remember that child sexual exploitation is not a catch all for all forms of sexual harm in adolescents. And actually we see it being used in that way. If we see that it's an adolescent who's experiencing abuse, we think CSE. If we see it's a younger child, we think another form of sexual abuse. But it is not a catch-all category for all forms of sexual harm in adolescents. And if there is not an exchange, then it is not CSE. Now, please don't hear me say by that, that it is not something we need to pay attention to. It's another form of abuse that we do need to pay attention to, but it wouldn't actually fall under the definition of CSE. And so because of that, it's really important that when we're thinking about educating and talking about child sexual exploitation, that we do that in the context of the fact that it is one of many forms of sexual harm that young people, children and young people can be exposed to, and that we educate around all of these types of forms and not just focusing in on one particular singular type. And so although today I am going to focus in on child sexual exploitation, it's really important we understand that and that's what we're here to focus on today. Um, I will be pulling out kind of the learning that is of a relevance to other forms of sexual harm as well. So when we think about child sexual exploitation, when I started out in the field 12, 13 years ago, it wasn't a term that anybody really knew anything about. But nowadays, actually, it is a term that the public recognise because of the media coverage that there has been. But actually, what the average person thinks about when they hear sexual exploitation is what these images show. It's, it's the grooming and abuse of young white girls, by groups of Asian men. And yes, absolutely, we have had many cases of that, but it is not the only form of child sexual exploitation. And, and it's really important that we challenge these these partial understandings of what child sexual exploitation is. In some ways, it's slightly more dangerous that we have a partial understanding than none at all, because actually what has happened is we've really focused in attention on particular sources of harm, particular groups of young people who we think are vulnerable to this. And when we shine a light on those, actually what we do is leave the others in the darkness and leave them hidden and give young people a really false sense of the places where risk might lie, of who is at risk, and actually leave them more unprotected because we are not giving them a full picture of where risk lies. So it's really important that when we think about CSE with young people, we think about it in its most holistic sense. And actually what we know is CSE can take many different forms. And I've put some here, you're going to get the slides afterwards. I'm not going to run through them all. But what you can see from a quick glance here is that it is by individuals, it is by groups, it is by peers, it is by adults. It can be a one-off incident, it can be an ongoing pattern. So there are so many different manifestations of CSE and it's really important that we encompass all of these and, and open our eyes and young people's eyes to the range of ways in which this can occur. So what we do know from research evidence and from cases that we have had around CSE is, as I say, it can be perpetrated by a wide range of people, individuals or groups, adults or peers, and important to remember, family or non-familial. Very often when we think CSE, we only think about it occurring outside the family home, but there also are cases of family members perpetrating CSE. And as I say, it might be a one-off incident or it could be an ongoing pattern of abuse. I suppose the most important message I want to get across um, to you today is any child or young person can experience CSE. We tend to look, talk a lot about vulnerable young people and risks that there are for young people, but actually any young person can experience CSE. And it's really important that we don't give false narratives about it's you're only at risk if you're this type of young person or this is going on in your life. 
Other things we know about CSE, so CSE and sexual violence um, more generally is gendered. Uh, females are disproportionately affected by it, but boys are also affected. And we also know from research that actually part of the reason we have lesser numbers of boys is not only about prevalence, but it's also about identification. And we are not as good as identifying sexual harm when males experience it. We tend to see them as the ones causing harm, not the ones experiencing harm. And to just give a very concrete example of this, in the very first piece of research I did in this years ago, I remember a residential care worker sharing about a young male 14 years of age who came back to the home wearing nothing but a pair of boxers and a duvet wrapped around him and and she was reflecting back and going we 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 didn't question that we didn't think anything we just what thought oh what's he been up to what's he done to himself but actually if that was a young female coming back in just a brand knickers and a duvet around her alarm bells would have been ringing so actually we know from research that we can see the exact same presenting features between males and females but that we, we can particularly struggle to recognise it when it is young men who are being exploited. The same is true in terms of um, young people from different ethnicities. Again, it tends to be more easily picked up when young people are, are um, white young people who are being abused. And actually those from other ethnicities can be much more hidden and can be much more hidden from services who are working in the field as well. The most frequently identified age at which um, we see cases of CSE has historically always kind of been 12 to 15 years of age when we first pick up what's happening. And though particularly in recent years, we are increasingly seeing it impacting younger children with cases of eight, eight to 11 year olds being referred to service, particularly when um, the exploitation has been online. And at the other age, we also at the other end of the age spectrum, we also need to remember that CSE doesn't just affect those under 16 who can't consent to have sex. 16 and 17 year olds can be sexually exploited and very frequently are and actually sometimes have additional vulnerabilities at that older age. So yes, certain cohorts may be more vulnerable and it's important that we are aware of those vulnerabilities, but particularly with online abuse, perpetrators have extended reach. And we see CSE occurring in the family home, in community settings, online and of particular relevance to today's seminar also occurring in between pupils in schools. And we're also seeing a real crossover between the online and offline environments in recent years. So I just want to spend a little time thinking about some of the complexities of CSE. Why is it so hard to get our heads around? Why is it so hard to respond to? And for me, a lot of the particular complexities around this relate to that exchange part of the definition. And actually we see particular challenges where the young person is the one receiving something in exchange for the sexual act. And that's what I'm going to focus in on today. So the real difficulty with CSE and with a young person actually receiving something in return um, for the sexual act as part of the abusive encounter is that actually very often the young person can be being harmed and gaining and benefiting at the same time. It is not a simple scenario of everything about this is absolutely awful and I'm waiting for you to come and rescue me because actually the young person, the definition talks about them receiving something they want or need. And actually the fact that they want or need something may obscure the abusive nature of what's going on. So the young person themselves may feel in control, may think this is not abusive because actually I'm manipulating them. You know, they're the idiots who are giving me a bottle of vodka for a blowjob. And, and actually we see this mentality sometimes in the young people feeling in control because they are getting something they want or need. And very often they may not want to give that up, but actually very often they are just not in a position to be able to give that up. I think particularly of um, a young female, a 13 year old, um, again, an early research that I did, who was going out, she was initiating every single exchange. Nobody was controlling or grooming her. She was going up to people and saying, I'll give you a blue job for a bottle of vodka or for the price of my taxi home, et cetera, et cetera. 
And actually, when thankfully the police officer who came across that case exercised professional curiosity and thought, hold on, what's what's going on here that you know that that the young person is doing this? And actually, what we realized is that the young person had a very severe and long history of sexual abuse. And actually, the only way they could get through every day was to numb out the trauma by blocking it out with alcohol. Now, let's face it, you as a teacher or their social worker or their parents, they're not going to give them a bottle of vodka to block it all out. And so the young person has had to find another way to source the alcohol they need. And so it might seem to us completely illogical and why are they doing that? But to that young person, she had found a way to meet her need to block out her trauma. And she was very clear that without looking back later on, without having had access to that, she wouldn't have still been with us. So it's really important that when we're looking at CSE that we don't just make judgments about to young people of why are you doing that? Sure, you can give that up. You don't need that. But that we actually try to understand the complexity of what's going on in that situation. Young people can also have really strong ties to the people who are harming them in cases of CSE. Um, it could be perceived love. I remember reviewing a case study of, of a young girl who even after he was imprisoned and she learned that he had been having so-called relationships with multiple girls, she was still sending him letters saying, I'm so sorry they've done this to you. I love you. I'm waiting for you. And perpetrators can be very skilled and clever at creating that dependency, at making them think that others don't understand them. And I, I understand you. Your family don't love you. I love you. And that creates really, really strong emotional bonds that we can't underestimate when we are looking at these circumstances. What we also need to be very aware of is that actually sometimes it can be that the reason the young person is ensnared in this situation is that they've been given so-called free alcohol and drugs for a while and now they're being told they're in debt and they have to pay them back or they're being threatened as to what will happen them or what will happen someone they love if they don't keep going back and letting this happened to them. And again, that that threat of I will do something to someone you love is such a powerful threat. I can think of one young person in particular who kept going back despite the fact that professionals could have protected her. But we subsequently learned that they threatened to move to her younger sister if she doesn't keep coming back. So all of this makes CSE and this concept of exchange incredibly complex and requires a really sensitive, curiosity driven approach, both to how we educate about it and to how we are aware of looking to see if something is coming up. Young people frequently fear being judged or blamed for what has happened or feel complicit in their abuse. And as a result of this and many other things, we know from research that there is a very low likelihood of a young person verbally directly telling you that they are experiencing child sexual exploitation. But I know in many a case, they tell us not in words and they indicate through actions and behaviours. And as this young person's quote shows, I, I was throwing hints because I didn't want it coming out of my mouth. I wanted people to work it out. So there is a real onus for us as professionals and indeed as parents, aunts and uncles, people, you know, adults in young people's lives to be exercising curiosity, to be noticing when things change and to be creating open avenues of communication where a young person can come to us. I said before that one of the difficulties is about this kind of exchange and that young people kind of can be seen as somehow it's less abusive because you're initiating it or you're getting something in return. And I think part of the problem that has contributed to this is this idealised victim scenario that we've created. Some of you may recognise this image. It was part of a big national campa campaign um, years ago trying to draw attention to CSE. And you can see as we look at this, that it was called puppet in a string. The young person is entirely manipulated, controlled at the hands of the perpetrator and has no say or influence over what's happening to them. And that is, of course, 
the case in some cases of CSE and in many cases of other forms of sexual abuse as well. But particularly where the young person is receiving something they want or need in this complex interaction, actually very often it's not that simple. And those are the cases where serious case reviews have time and time again shown that we have judged those children and young people. We have said they are making active lifestyle choices, they're prostituting themselves, they're putting themselves at risk, and we have somehow seen them as less of a victim and less deserving of our support. But the more young people I meet, most of my research is with young people who've experienced CSE about their experiences and about what they want from professionals like you. I, I learn that these simplistic narratives don't reflect the reality of young people's experiences. And so we need to find a better way to conceptualize and understand what's going on. And for me, a really helpful way to do that is this concept of constrained choice or can be called survival strategies. Young people may be making choices, but they are doing so in situations that are far from ideal and not of their choosing. The 17 year old male who is homeless and who accepts a bed in someone's house for the night on the basis they have to have sex with them. But actually that feels less risky than hanging out on the streets where they just don't know what might happen to them. So yes, they made a choice but not a choice any one of us would ever want to make, and certainly not a choice that in any way takes away the abusive nature of what has just happened to them. So we need to remember and we need to help young people understand that even if there is choice, even if there is agency, that does not equate to responsibility or blame for what subsequently happens to them. And we also need to understand and help young people understand that the receipt of something, even if you get something, that doesn't negate the abusive nature of the act. It is still abuse that we want to respond to and we want to support them around. So I just want to briefly finish. I, I, I could talk all day. I run a five day course on this, so I'm quite amazed that I've stayed under 20 minutes on this. But I just want to finish by sharing some lessons from a piece of research that we published a couple of years ago. We did it for ICSA, the Independent Inquiry into Child Sexual Abuse. And it was research with young people eliciting their views on how they had been taught about online sexual harm in school. And I think there's some really important, strong messages in this that we need to hear about how we can do this better. And Liz is actually, I will just lead in with this and Liz will pick up on how do you then actually start to do this within the curriculum. But the first such a clear message from them and it is reiterated in every piece of work we do with young people. We have to accept that young people are going to be exposed to risk of CSE and other forms of sexual harm. And no matter how good our intents, we cannot protect them from exposure to that. So it's really important that we prepare them for it in advance. I know we can be really anxious and uncomfortable and embarrassed about talking to young people about sex and sexual abuse. Believe me, I grew up in a strongly religious family in Northern Ireland. I, I know what that's like, it doesn't come naturally. But we have to have those conversations. Perpetrators have no such qualms. You would be shocked at some of the stuff they say to young people. So we need to prepare them in advance. As one young man said, there's no point in learning about a situation after the situation had goddamn happened. And unfortunately, that was his experience. He first learned about sexual abuse from a perpetrator, not in a protective manner. And the other, I think, false conception we can have is young people don't want to talk about these issues. They don't want to talk about them with adults. They'd be far too embarrassed. Oh, my goodness. Every time we involve young people in research, I, I am just blown away by the insights they share on this, how willing they are to share on this. And given the right environment, young people want to talk to us about these issues. And actually learning from them is absolutely critical to ensure that our preventative efforts are relevant to their ever shifting lives. I keep thinking I understand it, but as a woman in my late 40s, I didn't even use a computer until I was doing my master's. They live in a very different world to me and we have to learn from them if we are to protect them properly. And again, when you're talking about these things in the class, it's so important that you take what we call a trauma informed approach and um, that you go in thinking about the fact that 
at least one person, probably more in that room, has actually been exposed to this already and having a real sensitivity and understanding of how you need to talk about it and actually what their reactions might be. And in that extra research, one in 10 of the young people told us they had learned about online sexual harm through personal experience. So again, Liz is going to pick this up, but I, I just reiterate this so much. Learning has to be holistic. It can't just be one lesson about one particular thing. It has to be in a kind of really holistic thing about all manifestations of harm. And the key thing young people told us is don't just preach at us. Don't just stand up the front and talk, talk, talk. We will switch off. Actually, learning should be interactive and iterative and they should get to set the agenda with you about the things they want to talk about, engaging in the complexity and questions. And finally, educative efforts must consider avoidance of perpetrating harm and as well as experiencing it. As a young person told us, well, don't just tell us not not to get pictures of ourselves, tell them not to ask for them and tell them not to send them on. We very often just, our, our conversations are about young people protecting themselves, but actually we need to educate for the future of young people learning not to do things that are harmful towards other young people. And again, a really clear message in that piece of work and other pieces of work we've had is that young people say they have a particular knowledge gap around what is healthy, what is abusive in peer relationships, and they particularly want the chance to explore that. And I guess my final thing, I guess it's a bit of a plea actually to end with is, we have to be so careful about inadvertent messaging. So young people told us that the ways in which they have been taught about sexual harm to date has actually really centered around the, here's the things you should do and not do so you don't get harmed. Have your privacy setting on, don't talk to strangers, this, that and the other. And actually they end up when we ask them whose responsibility is it to prevent sexual harm, they tell us, well, it's mine. Well, it's absolutely not any child or young person's responsibility to prevent sexual harm, that responsibility lies with us as adults and those who care for them and wider society. So it is so important that we are careful that we don't even accidentally, like through, we sometimes call programs keeping yourself safe. We talk about putting yourself at risk. We need to avoid phrases that that, like young people hear them as saying, it's your fault. If you didn't listen to what we told you and this happened to you, it's your fault because they clearly tell us if they feel it is their fault, if they feel we will judge and blame them, they are not going to tell us what's going on and we're not going to be able to help. And so the last point which Liz is going to take you through is the importance of kind of having clear reporting and support structures and clear limits to confidentiality, but creating a safe environment in the lesson and in your school. So young people feel you care, you take it seriously and you really want to ensure that they are protected and they feel able to come to you for support. Thanks. Thank you Thank so you much, so Helen. Helen. Um, um, just a just couple a of question. questions. We've got some interesting ones. Um, one, you mentioned about you know, the, the gendered nature, that there are tendencies within genders. And we, we have a question about perpetrators, female perpetrators. Does that come up very much? Other examples where a young person experiences CSE with adult females, not just males? Yeah, so again, that is quite gendered and the majority um, of known perpetrators, and I purposely say no because known because we know there are lots we're not aware of. The majority are males, but I have seen plenty of cases of females um, perpetrating child sexual exploitation in the community towards their children either on their own or being part of a network who do that. So yeah, certainly um, females can pl place a risk as well. Thank you. And, and one which is very kind of of the, the period, only fans and, and articulations in the press that sex work is real work. Has this blurred the lines in people's mind about um, if transactional sex is abusive? That, that's a really interesting one um, and I would say an unresolved one because there is that tension and particularly when it is adolescents experiencing CSE, that difficulty of how we see adolescents generally of you're not an adult, you are a child but you're not quite a child like a younger child and actually I would say in terms of 
under 18s, there is the recognition that it is different when someone is under 18, particularly when they're under 16. But actually, the offences are very clear. The offences around abuse of a child through sexual exploitation are very clear that even if the child initiated it all, that it is still an offence if it is against any under 18s. So I think it's a bit, I realise that's not a very clear answer. It feels a bit of a muddied water when it comes to adolescents who are experiencing it. Thank you. And Helen will be joining the panel at the end. So so let's move on to our second presentation. So we'd like to, to welcome Liz Laming, who is um, the, the head of, sorry, the subject specialist of secondary in PHSE Association, um, who's going to talk about how we can actually deliver some of this stuff in the curriculum in the classroom. Thank you, Liz. Thanks Paula. Hi everyone. Um, so as Paula said, my name's Liz. I'm a subject specialist at the association and it's great to be here with you all today. I'm going to be drawing on a lot of what Helen's been discussing and really looking in more depth at what all of this looks like in the classroom and how we can teach about child sexual exploitation through the PSHE education curriculum. So to begin really, as Helen's just been discussing, it's really important that we understand that sexual exploitation can involve young people being groomed into trusting their abuser, not understanding sometimes that they're being abused, uh, they might depend on their abuser, they might be too scared to tell anyone what's happening because they don't want to get into trouble um, or risk losing them potentially, or they might believe they're actually in a really loving consensual relationship. And when this is happening online as well, young people might be persuaded or forced to um, you know, have sexual conversations, send explicit images of themselves or take part in sexual activities via webcams or smartphones. Abusers might then threaten to send images or, or videos or, or copies of conversations to families and friends unless they take part in further activity. And it's worth bearing in mind as well that images or videos might continue to be shared long after that sexual abuse has stopped. So it's a really complex issue and whilst education is obviously vital and all children should have access to education which informs and which empowers them, education isn't really preventative in this instance because prevention approaches usually focus on changing the behaviour of a young person but we can't necessarily protect a child from an adult sex offender who wields power and control over them in a wide variety of ways. So it's really important that we're clear about what education can and what it can't do. And schools obviously do have the potential to play a really invaluable role in supporting young people. And the evidence suggests that whole school approach is a really effective model. And that includes having a zero tolerance culture, responding appropriately to peer on peer um, abuse and sexual harassment, reviewing school policies, involving all members of the school community, raising awareness with all stakeholders about the school's role. And remember too, that sometimes it might be appropriate to get parents and carers on board as well, because they're important partners and information provided by schools can really help to facilitate discussions at home too. And all of this links really closely, as you can see there, with you know, staff having appropriate training in, in child protection and safeguarding. But as I said, it is really important that we're clear about what the limitations are as well and to understand the role of PSHE education in particular. So as Helen's just been discussing, in, in the same way we wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't teach lessons about reducing the risk of being neglected or abused to a young person who's being neglected or abused, we can't teach young people a series of lessons about CSE and then just expect them to not be exploited. So just because they've got the education about abuse and grooming and violence doesn't mean they can necessarily use that to protect themselves from it occurring. And evaluations of, of different CSE programmes really support this. And Helen's just been talking about that they, they show mixed results of effectiveness. The positive effects of these sort of programmes and these lessons include things like building confidence in young people, increasing knowledge, changing some attitudes that might legitimise really harmful behaviours. And young people can learn about healthy relationships and recognise those harmful behaviours and gain increased knowledge of support services. And that all might lead to disclosures and things too. Without appropriate guidance, young people are really left to find out for themselves what's what's kind of normal and receive really unhelpful messages sometimes from the media or like pop culture. So trained staff are needed to help young people to challenge those beliefs and perceptions and attitudes that can sustain really harmful sexual behaviours. So in terms of where this all fits into the curriculum, the statutory guidance for relationship, sex and health education contains lots of related topic areas. And as you can see here, or, or not see, I'm, apologies, I appreciate it's very small, but this is taken directly from the guidance. So you can obviously look at it afterwards. 
basically it's stating that by the end of primary school, people should know about staying safe online, uh, boundaries in different types of relationships, safe and unsafe physical contact, how to report concerns or worries and where to get advice and support. And this continues at secondary. So at secondary, these sort of CSE related topics are developed further. And by the end of secondary, the statutory guidance is saying that students should know about respectful relationships, including about sexual harassment and violence, about risks online, including risks involved in, in uh, image sharing, for example, and harmful behaviours online. And then goes on to more explicitly talk about uh, sexual consent and sexual exploitation, including understanding sexual pressure and how to manage that too. Regarding then how all this fits in across the whole PSHE education programme, you can see or not see, again, I'm sorry it's so small, um, you can see an example here basically of a primary PSHE education curriculum map. This is one of our programme builders for PSHE education. And what these do essentially is take all those topics, so including those from the previous slides, and map them out across year groups. So it's taking a whole curriculum and mapping it out into an age appropriate way. Importantly, Obviously, we need to be sure that the learning we're delivering is relevant to the concerns and lives of young people or will be soon. And I think this is the point Helen was making as well. You know, in, the, in the simplest terms, it makes sense to teach kids how to independently and safely cross a road before we expect them to do it for the first time. And the same is true for using the Internet, for engaging with people online, for starting intimate relationships, managing relationships where they experience pressure or managing influence. And there is a tendency to sometimes want to leave more, more difficult or, or sensitive topics until pupils are older. But in many cases, there is the risk then of it becoming irrelevant and, and just too late for those who need it the most. Learning does, however, also need to be understandable and accessible to pupils in the class. And in practice, that means finding out what pupils know before starting a topic before planning to teach um, a topic using baseline assessment. But equally, it might mean designing lessons and activities where pupils can uh, can access different levels of challenge or where materials are, are differentiated, as you would in any other lesson in any other subject, to allow all pupils to participate at a level that's right for them. Age appropriateness is obviously crucial here as well, especially when we consider that younger and younger pupils are accessing the internet using a tablet independently for the first time. So all those considerations do need to be taken into account too. The other really important thing to, to note here is, is that the, the benefits and, and the outcomes of a PSHE education programme that includes obviously these topics related to CSE that can only be really achieved through this planned programme of, of timetabled lessons through which the learning is gradually sequenced and embedded over time. So a spiral curriculum essentially is one that gradually introduces and revisits themes with increasing complexity as it as it's, sorry, develops through, through the key stages. So this enables this exploration of topics and themes in a very progressive way. So you're starting with the foundational building blocks and progressing to more nuanced and, and complex concepts. And this is backed by the evidence as well for effective CSE programmes and lessons, which suggests that sort of refresher sessions are needed. So you're revisiting topics year on year and building on that earlier learning. So, for example, if we look at these sort of teeny tiny boxes, you can see in the safe relationships theme, um, the purple boxes on the left there. What essentially this is doing is showing how you might map out revisiting this, this theme of safe relationships year on year. So starting in year one and developing it through to year six. So in year one, you might begin to explore what things are private and what might be shared publicly. Building on this in year two by introducing the role pressure from others has in staying safe. At lower key stage two, we're looking more at personal boundaries, responding to hurtful behaviour. And then finally, in upper key stage two, we're looking at things like physical contact and feeling safe and, and starting to explore consent in different situations. And it's also important that teaching balances knowledge, skills and attributes as well. So helping young people develop those skills and strategies that allow them to apply their knowledge really effectively. And the same rules apply then for the secondary PSHE education curriculum. So it's the same thing here in year seven. We might have a unit on building relationships, thinking about new friendships and forming those new relationships and relationship boundaries develop that further in year eight by thinking about identity and relationships. At year nine, we start to introduce things like peer influence and, and start to explicitly talk about relationships and exploitation. 
In year 10, this goes through to healthy relationships and relationship challenges. And then finally, in year 11, you can build on everything that's come before to explore things like communication in relationships and addressing those relationship challenges, including abuse and exploitation. So lessons within each of these units should help young people to recognise inappropriate and unhealthy um, relationships and behaviours, identify trusted adults who they can talk to, inform them about the support services available. And again, this needs to reflect to the reality of how young people actually socialise and how they communicate. So relevance here is really important. So we need to be talking about online relationships, abuse and exploitation, as well as offline in everything we're doing. And if we dive into one of those spirals in, in a slightly more detail, then we've got, you can see, um, there we go. Apologies. Um, we can see here the, the yellow at the bottom there is thinking about key stage one. So at key stage one, pupils are starting to think about the concept of keeping secrets and when it's safe or not to do so, as well as what they should do if they feel un unsafe or, or worried about anything. The pink then is key stage two, and that's developed further. Concepts like breaking confidence to keep safe, these are introduced at this stage, as well as to start starting to look at kind of more in depth at recognising pressure to do something unsafe or uncomfortable. And laying this foundation at primary means that the blue box, key stage three, students can more explicitly explore characteristics of abusive behaviours, including violence and exploitation online and offline, and how to access support services for themselves or others. And then finally in the green at key stage for they're building on everything to explore things like manipulation, coercion, persuasion and focus really on developing skills and strategies to respond to exploitation and other abusive behaviours in relationships. So these are just references taken from our programme of study for PSHE education and it's just giving a little snapshot really of what some of those spirals might look like and how we start to build in the CSE related content. Of course it's really important that we're refining curriculum maps or long-term plans based on students' needs. And as Helen's just been talking about, according to the, you know, the evidence base, young people's involvement in the in the development and the delivery of CSE programmes really adds that, that credibility, the authenticity, the acceptability, so all these key factors for the impact of education. So it's worth conducting surveys or questionnaires with students, utilising your student voice groups or student councils as a vehicle for finding out their needs and asking them you know, what they already know and what they'd like to learn about, using it as an opportunity to, to listen to what they already seem to be really knowledgeable about and what they don't seem to understand about yet or what they might have misconceptions about, and then tailor your curriculum on, on student needs in your local context. So speak to students, but also as you can see there, speak to colleagues, speak to the people you work with to find out what's going on with your pupils in your setting. So this can include speaking to your teaching teams, your form tutors, your pastoral teams, your safeguarding teams, but also teaching assistants, staff in the playground or in the dining hall, like liaising with your learning mentors. So you can really make sure your curriculum is addressing the needs of the pupils in your particular setting. And then finally, I briefly mentioned using baseline assessment um, earlier, but this is a really important aspect of planning and delivering PSHE education lessons. So not teaching anything new until you know your pupils existing knowledge, understanding skills, beliefs about a topic. You can't make assumptions in PSHE education based on their age or year group. And they often, you know, young people have a wealth of knowledge and values and information and assumptions about sex, relationships, abuse, grooming and so on. So it's a really useful exercise to explore where they already know about certain topics, where that knowledge came from, and then tailor your lessons accordingly to, to kind of respond to their existing knowledge too. There's also some really important best practice principles that apply to uh, all PSHE education topics, and I'm going to focus in on a few in particular. Sorry, a few coming up. There we go. Um, so some of the things to really be aware of that, that Helen's just touched on are things like making sure we're establishing a safe learning environment, and that's for the students and for you. So making sure we negotiate ground rules and we distance the learning, and I'll go on to talk about that more um, shortly. But also things like considering your responses to to their questions and so making sure their questions are valued, that you you're aware of the reactions you give off um, through your facial expressions and your, your body language to their questions, giving factual age appropriate answers when you can, but buying time or kind of parking the question when you can't. It's also important that we're including um, lots of different scenarios and case studies and examples that involve lots of different students from all different backgrounds that were being really inclusive and again not making assumptions about pupils identity or beliefs or experiences. 
It's also important and relevant sometimes to make sure we are closing lessons safely, that we're giving students time to decompress when we've been talking about these really sensitive, heavy topics, making sure we've got time to get out that heavy headspace before we send them off to the next lesson. When we're selecting resources too, it's important to make sure you know, as teachers we're not increasing stigma or prejudice views by choosing images or resources or stories that are over dramatic or, or that extreme or, or show sort of worst case scenarios. And similarly, you know, it's important to create this really uh, this culture of open exploration of topics, but it's vital to ensure that lessons don't become instructional to pupils at risk of vulnerabilities. So, for example, inadvertently giving them tips on where they should go to meet people online or showing them the extract of a conversation and actually inadvertently giving them the language to manipulate someone in the future. So we do need to be aware of what, what messages we're sending in lessons. I'm going to focus in on a few, a couple of these in a bit more detail now. So first of all, thinking about protecting students in particular. It's important to distance the learning. So what we mean by that is instead of asking young people about their own experiences of, of harm or trauma to begin a discussion, we are using those case studies, scenarios, examples in which that young person isn't having to utilise their own experiences and their answers. And instead, they're approaching topics very objectively. Similarly, making sure we consider students with vulnerabilities. So you might be aware that there are students in your class who've reported incidents of abuse or who've experienced historic abuse. And if that's the case, obviously consider whether it's appropriate for them or not to, to take part in the lesson or if they're actually going to be quite re-traumatised by the content. And you might want to discuss strategies with them or, or heads of year or teachers or um, whatever the case may be in your school. For example, then the student might benefit from an exit card, which they can utilise during the lesson, or they just might choose not to participate in the lesson from the start. But it's also really important that we are aware that just because something hasn't been reported in the school, you know, school doesn't have any reports of abuse, that doesn't mean there are no victims of abuse or, or CSE among your student population. So if you know your lesson is about grooming abuse, sexual violence or another topic that might be quite distressing, it's a good idea to give young people a warning about what's coming up. So whether at the start of you know, a term or half term, making students aware of the topics they're going to be looking at over the coming weeks and just informing your students in advance means that students can be prepared for that lesson content. And those with any undisclosed concerns can have an opportunity to speak to someone before the lesson if they need to. Obviously, as well in class, public disclosures are not what we're aiming for, and they should be avoided for a number of reasons. You know, the teacher's unable to manage the disclosure in the moment, and the student might get a really unsatisfactory immediate response to what they've said. Other students in the room are then made aware of a, of a real sensitive issue that they were otherwise unaware of and might not react appropriately. And also the student in that moment might be really happy to share their experience with the class, but later on might really regret that and wish they hadn't been given the forum to do that. That all being said, despite you know teachers' best efforts to minimise public dis disclosures, it is possible that students might still make them in class. And if a student does begin to share something that makes you concerned, it's important to try and limit what they say in front of the whole class. And we, we sometimes call protective interrupting. So basically interrupting them, but reassuring them that you will follow up um, at the end of the lesson. So, for example, some of the things you might say there, you know, could I ask you to pause? Sounds like you're going to say something that I need to hear about, but it's better if it's just the two of us. Or could you just hold on for, for a minute? We'll talk about it outside the room. But having this kind of protective interrupting where appropriate can be really, really important. The other big thing that we need to be aware of, particularly in relation to CSE, is attempting to induce shock or fear or shame through PSHE lessons can lead to really unpredictable responses in young people. And sometimes quite um, quite intuitively, we, we tend to feel that if we can make a particular behaviour like sharing images online or talking to strangers online or sharing personal information, if we can make that appear frightening or to have scary consequences, we kind of assume young people will just choose not to do it. But our response to fear is obviously much more complex than that, and it can result in really different behavioural responses from different individuals. So as it says there, the evidence suggests that inducing shock, fear or shame is rarely effective in promoting behaviour change and can have really unintended consequences which are detrimental to the learning. It's worth noting videos in particular. So historically, messages in CSE related videos quite often fail to place any any responsibility or agency on the offender and sometimes position the child's actions and decisions as lead, the things leading to devastating consequences. And the harm of that was really severe. 
as well as questioning that the effectiveness of that, obviously one of the most important reasons why we shouldn't really be using films which use shock, threat, violence in the classroom is is ethics. You know, we, we wouldn't want young people to experience fear, like you know, a bodily response, a heightened heart rate in the classroom. In, inducing that experience not only inhibits their learning, but it's clearly quite unethical and a bit of a rights issue. And young people shouldn't be afraid in those safe spaces. And there are much more interesting and effective ways to use education to help young people than trying to provoke this sort of reaction. So instead, as much as possible, using non-graphic resources, so those that don't contain videos of abuse and grooming and sexual offences or harm to children and don't contain graphic descriptions of, of abuse and exploitation, but instead looking at resources that focus on building a young person's um, sense of self-worth or feelings of self-efficacy or um, resources that talk about sex and relationships and healthy and unhealthy relationship behaviours and really embedding that throughout the curriculum. A couple of the other key things really to think about are just to ensure that lessons do reflect reality and avoid victim blaming. So again, the historically examples of, of um, CSE and grooming in, in films and things were quite often very stereotypical and repeated the same scenarios time and time again, despite the reality being that young people are abused and groomed and exploited in a whole range of, of, of contexts by a whole range of people. So it's really important that we're not reinforcing outdated ideas about CSE and that we tackle this narrative about risk taking behaviours in the classroom and, and victim blaming of, of young people. So shifting the focus from changing their risky behaviours to actually disrupting perpetrators and focusing on you know, seeking help and support as much as possible. So the last, last thing we just need to be aware of as well with this is making sure we understand that for young people there's no longer this thing of the real world and an online world. The online world is their real world and there's no solid boundary between the two. So we do need to take care in our language and make sure we're talking about the, the online world and the offline world without suggesting the former isn't real life. And also worth bearing in mind that young people use online resources and communication to explore you know, love and romance and sexuality. And for them, warnings about you know, risky sexual conversations and people that, with people they don't know might be at odds with their peer norms and their developmental interests. If they've communicated online with someone over time who seems really interested in them and they've developed this really strong relationship with, kind of warnings about meeting up with someone who they don't know might seem quite ineffective. What education can do is help young people distinguish between when someone really cares about them from when someone is being sexually exploitative and the behaviours displayed in those scenarios and other healthy and unhealthy relationship behaviours. A couple of the other things just to note before I um, wrap up are just making sure when in all lessons we are giving pupils a range of support options, whether it's face to face, over the phone or online, so they can seek a source of support they feel comfortable with and that's most appropriate for their needs as well. They should be given the same level of respect shown to adults subjected to abuse who are given the choice to disclose or not disclose and to report or not report. If a young person wants to tell you something and you've successfully created that safe environment and relationship for them to approach you and confide in you, they'll disclose when they're ready. And if they don't want to tell you something, it's really important that we are giving them other means to disclose and report, um, obviously, for other services. And in line with that as well, it's making sure that we're not just telling them um, where they can access support and why to access it, but also what might happen next. So pupils are often so concerned about what happens after they've asked for help and worry about that telling an adult about something that's happened to them is actually going to result in more problems. And that can be a really significant barrier in them seeking help and support. So where possible, it's important to demystify what's going to happen when they do. And then finally, linking with that, we also want to ensure we focus on the rights young people have so they can recognise when those rights are being broken. So um, as, as Helen was talking about, abuse might be in family relationships. So the rights they have in family relationships are actually important for them to know. So to be cared for, to not to have an adequate sort of standard of living, to have opportunities to relax and play, for others to act in their best interest, knowing those rights is quite important. As are knowing rights in personal relationships, so being able to set boundaries around intimacy, um, to choose how much time to spend with another person, to consent to different levels of intimacy. And there are shared rights in both relationships too, to feel safe, to be respected, to be protected from violence or abuse and so on. And if we can emphasise that everyone's entitled to those rights and it's everyone's responsibility to treat others according to those rights, and we can get students to sort of consider that they have the right to report or not, that can be really helpful again in, in just getting them to identify what relationships are sort of positive, unhealthy and so on. 
just to finish up then, I'm just going to signpost a couple of um, lesson plans and resources that might help with some of these CSE related topics. So we do have um, the PSHE Association has produced uh, consent lessons for key stages one to four. Um, Medway have also produced lessons on healthy and unhealthy relationship behaviours, which can be really helpful. The Home Office have a series of lessons on serious organised crime and also a series of lessons called Something's Not Right, which specifically focus on um, disclosing abuse. And then CEOP have a great range of resources for younger students and older ones focusing on sharing information online, sharing images, images and also online blackmail. So all of these touch on topics closely related to CSE, which you might find um, useful. And then just finally, before I pass back, just to finish off really with some, some sort of top takeaway tips, taking a whole school approach and recognising the limitations of education is really important. So preventative CSE ed education isn't necessarily appropriate here. So instead, focus on what we can do to help pupils. The purpose of PSHE education is to to equip pupils to live safe and, and, and healthy and happy lives. And it has a crucial role to play in supporting students to seek help when they need it and to encourage them to speak to trusted adults if they've experienced something that's upset or, or, or worried them. So we want to support young people as much as possible um, throughout all our lessons, and uh, you know, regardless of which area of sort of CSE this Helen's mentioned we're talking about. We need to ensure content's age appropriate and relevant. We need to make sure we are speaking to, to staff, people on our networks, key stakeholders and using baseline assessment to make sure needs are being met. Establish those safe learning environments and finally ensure staff feel confident and supported as well. So before teaching a lesson related to CSE, it might be helpful for staff to talk to their, their line managers or their heads of department or other colleagues about any concerns they might have. Similarly, you might be faced with managing more disclosure, disclosure sorry, from pupils and that can take an emotional toll too. So it is really important that staff do feel supported in those school environments. Um, I'm not going to hand back to um, Paula, but thank you very much for listening. Thank you so thank much. You so much. Uh, I think we'll deal with questions at the end, end actually, because um, um, there's some interesting ones that the whole panel can can answer. So, so with pleasure, I'd like to introduce our, our final speaker for today. Welcome, Sam Whitaker. Sam is the associate assistant head teacher. Uh, who, who has a, a focus on recovery curriculum and vulnerable students at Seaford Head School in Seaford, East Sussex. Thank you, Sam. Uh, thank you, Paula. So I'm just going to spend about 10 minutes just going through some resources that we've created um, in East Sussex as part of a bigger programme, um, kind of as Helen, Helen was saying, and obviously Liz building up as part of a larger program about relationships and how we really teach young people to be to be safe and healthy within their relationships with other students. Um, these are very short snippets. They absolutely don't um, act as standalone lessons. They form part of a wider curriculum that spirals up from kind of year seven to 11. So these are secondary based. Um, so I'll just kind of whiz through some of them. They are available in the slide deck, so I'm not going to spend hours on them. Um, but just in terms of, you know, a lot of questions we get from our PSHE leads in East Sussex is how can we assess that our young people have learned things through a curriculum programme that might not have a formal examination at the end. So we might use something like this. So we'd ask students to indicate their confidence levels at the start of a lesson. We might get some feedback. So as a teacher, we are aware of, of our class and kind of where they're at in terms of their existing knowledge. And then so we've got a nice neat end point. We'd revisit this back at the end and then hopefully we can see that their confidence has increased. If they're still low in some areas, then we can pick that back up in the next lesson. Um, simply kind of halfway through, you know, not rattling on for an hour, you know, maybe not realising that our students have not understood a concept and then bang, we're on to the next lesson because curriculum time is so precious. So just a very simple way of checking knowledge, and this could be, you know, in a work booklet, it could be a hands up, it could be a traffic light system, it could be a moving around the classroom system, whatever we've got just to ensure that our students are still learning and um, I appreciate it, it's very small in there but also having the opportunity for students to ask questions anonymously so quite an easy way of doing that is handing out post-it notes and everyone gives a post-it note back at the end of the lesson whether it's got to question on it or not and then we can pick those back up in the next lesson and kind of address any misconceptions or or knowledge maybe the young people are not sure about and and you know don't want to share widely. Um, so, you know, as, as both our previous speakers have said, this has got to form part of a wider context. So these activities are not specifically about CSE. They will cover harmful sexual behaviours, reducing violence against women and girls, which, you know, is, is obviously on the agenda nationally at the moment. So we would look in a group 
over the course of their five years at secondary school about really drilling down what are healthy relationships, getting to elicit some of these examples here, go into depth about maybe what some of these mean, um, ensure that they know what a healthy relationship is, uh, either if they're in one or the way that they're acting in terms of a relationship. Um, and I think Liz mentioned, you know, this is in, in terms of relationships full stop. We would mention romantic and sexual relationships, but we'd also talk about friendships, you know, relationships with their peers, relationships with teachers, relationships with the wider community. Um, and then obviously looking at unhealthy relationships as well. Um, obviously, I'm going to whiz through these so we can cover the content. Again, you'll see that some of the things on the screen, most of them, in fact, would be in all of our relationships. You know, it's not just about romantic and sexual relationships. It's about encouraging that wider form of healthy relationships. Um, and obviously, they're moving specifically onto kind of the more harmful behaviours. We'd really drill out what abusive behaviours could potentially look like. Um, I've actually been teaching this week to year nines, tens and elevens because we keep repeating this to ensure that they've really got it down. And there's a lot of reinforcement about knowledge and terms. So what is gaslighting? What is coercion? What does manipulation look like? So this is kind of a starter for 10 to encourage a conversation. Um, in terms of kind of send resources, we might adapt this just to use maybe slightly different language. So what might we see in a positive language, a positive relationship, sorry and then giving them the prompts to put into positive and healthy and negative un and, and un unhealthy. Obviously, it depends on their send needs, but this is just a way that you can differentiate it slightly. Um, and obviously, you know, with the answers, we're putting them into the columns of what it is. And then we might have to drill down a bit more in terms of the definitions so they are aware of what those words actually mean. And we might give examples of behaviours that that are examples or what's quite powerful um, uh, examples that are non-examples, if that makes sense, just to really reinforce that knowledge with them. Understanding terminology is absolutely key because we hear this on the news, they hear it on social media, they'll hear it with reports. So it's really important that the young people understand the terminology so they are aware of, you know, not only the behaviours that might be seen or they might experience, but also what they've heard and how they can support other people really simple thing we put this in a workbook they just match it up and then the teacher will go through the definitions just so we're crystal clear on what the behavior behavior is and what the behavior isn't um slightly more challenging one so i might do this with older students as a recap reinforcement if they've done this in year nine i might put this back to year 11s can you remember the definitions and fill them in yourself um can we do a post it post it activity on a flip chart where we're building the definitions ourselves um, and then, of course, a send version where we've slightly simplified it as well, but got the same content across for those students to understand. And um, like I say, it's a very whistle stop tour. <laughs> Once we've kind of given them the knowledge and the skills and the understanding about behaviours and healthy relationships, we want to drill down into them assessing situations to work out whether they're acceptable, unacceptable or whether they need more information. We use this language, obviously you might use a different language, you might use harmful and non-harmful, um, you know, giving really clear indications. You'll notice on this there's no specific gender, you know, I saw that we had a question about genders. This is to ensure that we're not marginalising young people, you know, we're not saying that all women are victims of, of harmful sexual behaviours and men are all perpetrators. We're also taking into account that we will have young people in our classroom that maybe don't identify as male and female, so no names, depersonalised, no genders deliberately, class decides, has a debate, obviously it's unacceptable, <laughs> and then we'll tell them why it's unacceptable. Um, slightly more simplified send version, okay, not okay behaviours, you know, exactly the same concept, wolf whistling at someone, obviously we'd explain what wolf whistling is, um, as students like to do, they'll probably give us a kind example in the middle of a lesson of 30 people and then we'll have to try and bring it back again, but it is what it is. <laughs> But again, we're not putting, you know, the male builder wolf whistled at the young girl walking down the road. It's important that we are removing genders and names and personalizations within this content. Um, obviously not OK. And we go into why it's not OK. Um, and then we give a description of, of what it is. Um, how we potentially reflect. So again, putting it into a larger scenario. Um, I appreciate this is very, very small, but it's just a depersonalized scenario non-gendered names. So again, you can challenge assumptions from your class. So they will automatically presume that someone is male and someone is female. And then we can start challenging those gender stereotypes before we've even started. 
you know, it is difficult to write these without he and she and they in. Um, it can be a bit clunky in terms of language, but that's really important. So we're not victim shaming and we're going through exactly what the behaviours are. This is a fairly complicated one. So I do this with high level year 10s potentially. You could cut bits out. Again, I am whizzing through. These are on the slide decks anyway. Um, and then, you know, as, as Liz just mentioned, you know, how giving the information about how they can report safely. Um, so, you know, giving them the information, explaining what the information is. Um, and then you might recognize this flow chart from the previous one. So I've just taken it and made it a slightly different color. So I'd encourage my students to put their ideas into it um, within a work pack. And then we build on that. We then give them the information and knowledge, you know, from the class as a discussion, reinforcing that knowledge in there, which is this is one of the PSHE lessons. Um, and then obviously, you know, talk about the ongoing support. Quickly flipping through, this is something we use in our school. You know, we've got safeguarding team, all schools have got the pictures off, just let them know who they need to go to. Um, and I appreciate I'm running out of time, so I'm going to get even quicker. Um, and then, you know, I think Liz mentioned as well, this is just kind of seeing it in practice. This is a slide we'll use in the class almost at the end of every lesson. If a young person discloses, this is what we do in our school. And, you know, you might want to adapt it for your school, your setting, but so they're, they're completely aware because we've had feedback from our students saying, we reported it's great and then we don't really know what's happening. And that's because behind the scenes, it's gone on your system. It might have gone to the police. We are being asked as a school person not to be involved anymore. And actually, where's that feedback from the young person? So, you know, really telling them what will happen with their information um, and making it crystal clear. Just some links to, to some things that I know Liz has mentioned. Obviously, working in a school, we've got access to some broader um, kind of resources, I guess. And then we'd show that and we'd drill down with the young people about how they can get support. So encouraging them to look at those different support avenues. Um, and this is just an activity that young people could use to do that. So we'd give them the table. They'd have a think for themselves. And um, if you wanted to depersonalize it, you could say, if your friend needs support, where would you get it from? We've deliberately chosen to do it for who you need support so they specifically know who to go to after we've done this pretty heavy content um, and if they can't think of people for each category we put some examples up for them to fill in themselves um, and then obviously you know the ask it the ask it note is so powerful we use it in most PSHE lessons to be honest with you and um, we're just doing sex ed with the year 11s and some of the questions are eye-opening hilarious but very fascinating um, and in some ways slightly worrying the young people don't know it, but at least we can address those misconceptions the next time we meet them instead of them going onto Google and finding out who knows what and bringing up God knows what online. Um, so hopefully we're there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sam. I think we're going to go. Are we going to go to the panel now or should we ask a couple of packs? practical questions. I mean, perhaps a couple of practical questions um, that have come up that are quite interesting. One around group size um, and Liz, please chip in here as well. Um, is it better to deal with this kind of topic area in class size groups or in whole year group scenarios, um, you know, such as showing a video to a whole year group? We've had a couple of questions about that. So any thoughts on the optimum group size? I think, it, oh, well, sorry, mind if I just dive straight in? <laughs> yeah, please do. I think, it, I think it depends, you know, if we're talking about, if we're talking about PSHE education lessons, that is to be delivered to a whole class and you shouldn't be sharing anything that would potentially be quite upsetting or traumatic for pupils anyway. If we're talking about um, doing things with smaller groups, there's likely to be more intervention work or work for pastoral teams because it's going to be targeted and focused for particular pupils. But the core content that we're covering as part of the PSHE curriculum should be delivered as any other topic would be um, to a whole class. Thanks. And another practical question really about giving students warning when you're going to be talking about something sensitive in the classroom in advance. Um, there can be a difficulty with this if, if, if you say to a, cl uh, you know, a classroom that if you need to leave, please do, because that's quite exposing for the young person. Are there any suggestions about how to, to deal with that? 
I mean, I think it, it relates to Sam will have some great insight, I'm sure, to what they do in school. In terms of the, the points I was talking about earlier, I was telling them in advance, I think we'd very much recommend more in advance than you know the start of the lesson you know leave if you need to and that's that's for the student obviously to be caught off guard and it is exposing if they then stand up and walk out of the room but also the teacher is then left to manage potentially students walking off in the middle of the lesson so if you can in advance you know a week or two or at the start of every half term share the share curriculum maps on the school you know websites and things and so people know what's coming up they know who to talk to if they do have an issue. And then if you can have those conversations beforehand and decide what might be appropriate for that student, whether you give them an exit card and that could be you know, I don't know code words or something that they put their hand up and say they've got an appointment or a music lesson or, or whatever it is, rather than them absolutely standing up and, and strolling out and everyone's suddenly aware that there's there's some sort of issue there. That's obviously to be avoided. But Sam, you might have some more insight into the, the classroom. Yeah, I mean, absolutely telling them in advance. So we we've got roadmaps for our students. I'm sure many schools have. So at the end of one module, we'll tell them what the next module is going to cover, what we're looking at, um, especially around topics like this. We'd send a letter home to all parents at the beginning of the year advising what our curriculum is Obviously, on our website. When we get to this content, because it can be more sensitive and personal for young people, um, we send a follow up letter again to parents about a month before to explain to them what's going to happen. We ready the pastoral team so they're aware we might get more disclosures. So they're on the front foot, obviously using the tutors and their knowledge of the young people. We might engage with young people separately that we know might have, have sensitivities around this and have a conversation about whether it's appropriate for them to be in the classroom or not. Um, and kind of negotiate that on an individual basis. But yeah, just getting it in up front, um, reminding them every lesson, reinforcing that group contract and that group agreement every lesson. Um, and yeah, you know, having that time out, you know, students have got timeouts for all sorts of reasons. No one needs to know it's because they're finding this particular content uncomfortable. Thank you. A question about the curriculum and time to invest to this. Uh, I mean, our, our guidance, the department's guidance, leaves it up to schools to decide you know, how to plan this into their curriculum. But um, we've had a question about, does the, the PSHE Association recommend or suggest any particular curriculum time or teaching hours for the RSHE stat? We we would always recommend an hour a week um, where possible of discrete PSHE education lessons, just in order to, to deliver all topics and to effectively sequence the curriculum content as well. So an hour a week is the ideal. Schools may not always have an hour a week, so it's finding ways obviously to, to work within timetable constraints and things, but an hour a week is, is the ideal. Okay. A question for, for Helen and others who may want to, to chip in, which is, which is interesting, I think. We, I mean, we, we, we talked earlier about, um, yeah, this is not just about telling young people to look after themselves. This is, this is also about um, teaching young people not, not to abuse um, in the first place. And, um, and, and I think it's really interesting, that idea about prevention. It'd be useful to, to know, you know how you start to get these messages across to young people not to abuse and in particular enforcing the understanding of, of what consent really means. Yeah, happy to kick off. Um, th there is quite a wide body of research that shows um, real issues with young people's understanding around consent. Um, and I guess the first thing I would say on that is I don't think that is in any way the young person's fault. I think it is our failure as a society in education, etc., to have educated them correctly around that. And actually, we're setting young people up to fail in not doing that. We are setting them up to end up perpetrating harm without actually knowing it. Um, I think back to the research I did on gang associated sexual violence, and I sat across the room and interviewed many young men who thought they were describing sex to me but in reality were describing rape but genuinely didn't actually understand the difference and end up through a criminal justice system for doing that so i think the point and young people you know strongly make it is it is so important to be on to be educating around consent and there was a really interesting piece of work done by maddie coy and colleagues at london met um 
talking about kind of the really limited understandings of consent and like Sam has been talking about the use scenarios to kind of understand young people's um, understanding of consent and realise that it's very partial and it's also very premised on the fact that the responsibility is up to someone to say no I don't give consent and actually we should be shifting that to be saying the responsibility is on someone to check you are getting consent so consent is not the absence of someone withdrawing it and I feel really strongly and both Sam and Liz have talked about educating around consent about the importance of this clearly that's not going to change patterns of perpetration in the next year but we do need to think about this on a long-term basis as well and if we are building that in now we are building a future of both males, females, non-binary, who actually have that understanding of consent. And of course, there will be some, some who still intentionally harm, but I, I genuinely believe that there is quite a cohort of young people who are accidentally harming because we haven't educated them. So I think it's really important that we look at that. Thank you. We've had a couple of questions about you're vulnerable groups of young people and um, and again I, I know that you made the, the good point that that actually you know everyone is at risk of of CSE but um, but in terms of vulnerable groups of people is there any particular research on this and and in particular LGBTQ young people who are quite often overrepresented in homeless youth for example so there's not really a clear statistical answer on that where we can say statistically we know this group are versus that group. There are there are some um, very clear patterns. For example, we know that disabled children, children with a disability can be more at risk. Some LGBTQ maybe. I guess for me what I would highlight is the, the consistent pattern I see around who might be more vulnerable is those who are potentially marginalised and not considered in our mainstream responses. So actually being gay is not in and of itself a vulnerability, but society's inability to mainstream that and to make that acceptable and for young people to, to feel that they're struggling to be open about that actually creates the vulnerability. So I would really say that it's actually more about society's responses to particular characteristics of young people that makes them vulnerable. We've just finished a piece of research actually on young people's perspective on what does faith sensitive um, education look like given the requirement for it now to be faith sensitive and again that came out clearly that actually young people from faith backgrounds kind of may be potentially more at risk again because we see them as somehow other and different and you know they don't get access to the same things. So I think for me it is about Vulnerability is about our reactions and what we put out there is different and not mainstream more than any inherent characteristic in a child. Yeah. I think we have another question that actually you know, leads on really well from that. So, um, one, of, one of our um, delegates here who works in a mental health unit um, often has students with very low self-esteem and I think people in those groups can have low self-esteem and it's almost like they they recognize the behavior as being unhealthy but they 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 think they deserve it but they don't think they have a right to complain about it so so how how do we deal with that if if that is uncovered you know in, in classrooms or in units Sorry, I don't want to keep jumping in. Uh, I'll very quickly say on that um, next month, we're releasing a piece of research um, actually on young people talking about the emotional and mental well mental health well-being impacts of experiencing sexual abuse and actually, of course, particularly experiencing sexual abuse in adolescence. And those are massive. And actually, it, it's not a quick answer. It's not a quick answer at all because actually for, for young people who have experienced trauma, we know the core thing about abuse and trauma is it is all about other. It is not about the child, it is about them being subservient, their needs, their wishes, what they need, all being subservient to what the perpetrator does. So that does kind of obviously lead to very serious impacts in terms of self-esteem and confidence, etc. Flip side of that and the bit that I cling on to as we work in this field is that I see when young people get the right support 
that actually their lives can transform. And yes, sexual abuse has a massive impact on children, but actually with the right support, they can come through it. And we would talk a lot about a strengths-based approach. This won't be unfamiliar, I'm sure, to many of you, because actually these young people have such resilience. And actually it's about identifying and building that resilience. So the, the young girl I talked about, who was out exchanging sex for vodka, et cetera, actually the resilience she showed in keeping herself alive even if she felt just deserving of what was happening to her was massive and so it's about that that one person and again one of the clear messages from research is it only takes one person it could be a teacher it could be someone else in the class it could be someone at home one person who believes in them one person who creates that safe space and just really takes a really strengths-based approach that but also works on those natural implications of being abused and having your rights and needs diminished. Thank you, Helen. A practical question um, next. We have to talk about obviously the the, you know, the, the statutory curriculum, um, you know, up to key stage four. But are there any 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 advice or any good resources or any tips for, for teaching this with sixth form groups and 16, 17 year olds? I mean, in terms of resources available, there's a couple I can recommend that we've quality assured. So one that I showed a, a little extract from earlier was the Home Office Something's Not Right um, set of lessons. So there's a key stage three lesson, a key stage four and a key stage five. And the key stage five one really looks into um, warning signs of abusive behaviours in lots of different contexts, including online, and then sort of going into that how, where, why to report abuse in those increasingly independent contexts, I think. So once they've left home, once they're, they don't have support from, from family systems and things, where they can go to and to identify that relevant support in, in different circumstances. There's also um, a nice lesson from SEOP on online blackmail, so that's delving into some of that those issues, I think Helen, Helen mentioned this earlier about the, the reciprocal nature of sharing images and then being blackmailed later on. So that's for key stage five. And um, thinking about relationship behaviours, the Alice Ruggles Trust have got some key stage four to key stage five resources looking at unhealthy relationship behaviours, including harassment and stalking. Um, so those are some good places to start. I think you can find all those on, on our website as well. Um, and then Sam, I don't know if you've got experience for, for key stage five as well. Uh, yeah, I mean, we're quite fortunate that our, our Key Stage 5 leads in from our Key Stage 4, so we know what experiences they've had. But I think my advice for colleagues, maybe in a standalone sick form or a college, is that we need to establish the baseline of what learning has happened prior to their arrival with you. So, you know, in the same way as a secondary school needs to establish what has been taught at Year 6, because not everyone does follow the amazing PSHE guidance, um, you know, we need to work out where our starting point is and actually the reinforcement of what you've covered in maybe year 10 or year 11, just building on it to a slightly more complex language. And, and like you've said, putting scenarios in, you know, if you are at the pub on a Friday night and you've both been drinking, you know, talking about consent within a situation that these young people would find themselves in more realistically, obviously depersonalised, but, you know, really just reinforcing. So we for example, look at the definition of consent in year 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 and 13 and just keep revisiting, keep reinforcing, keep sequencing that as part of your curriculum. Thank you both. And, and a question here about younger children. I know you included some some examples of how you can broach with younger children, Liz, in, in your session. Um, but are there any tips about how to do because oh yeah unfortunately as Helen says the children being affected by this are getting younger and younger so any tips about how to to start to talk about this subject with eight-year-old children and younger I mean I think it, it probably builds into I don't want to be too repetitive of what I said before but thinking about sort of breaking the topics down in an age appropriate way so in those younger year groups you will be talking not you you know you're diving in at, with an eight-year-old talking about sexual exploitation explicitly but you're talking about those introducing those really healthy and unhealthy relationship behaviors and like Sam was saying in all different contexts as well so it's not about just focusing on intimate relationships which often consent and things are, are associated mm -hmm. with and actually it's it's uh, healthy and unhealthy behaviors with your friends with your family with your teachers um with your peers and and kind of building those foundational building blocks of that sort of age of thinking about relationship behaviours, what's 
it is you know recognizing the warning signs of appropriate and inappropriate touch and and personal space and and boundaries and and those sort of things and starting to introduce obviously that the online element there too that we know younger and younger people are accessing the internet alone that they have tablets at home and thinking about ways to sort of and I don't want to um, contradict things that Helen said if I say ways to stay safe online obviously we're not putting all responsibility on on young people at all but thinking about how to recognise when something online makes you a little bit worried or uncomfortable and what how to respond essentially that yes you might not be able to avoid it but could we help put something in place to you know seek help and support or who you should go to in those contexts. Helen I don't know if you've got any other additions to that. No that all sounds great I mean the the only other thing I would think about is put terminology aside and think about what are we getting at here and, and in essence, what we're getting at, if we're thinking specifically at CSE, is that someone might say, if you do this, I'll give you that. And actually, that concept of exchange can be introduced in a very, even if someone says they'll give something for this, that's still not a good thing. So for me, we can introduce kind of the core concepts of it, but in a very simple age appropriate way because we we do clearly hear from young people that if they got something back it does decrease the likelihood of passing on and they feel responsible so I think we can integrate those messages early. Thank you thank you all very much I'm, I'm going to start to bring everything to a close now and I, I think it's been yeah, it's, they always fly by these sessions and it has again and you know filled with with wonderful insight and practical tips just to kind of um go over again that we'll be sharing these slides including Sam's wonderful materials so you can look at those at your leisure at the end of the session and, um, and any important links that um, have come out in the session will also be shared at the end. Um, you should have the little box for um, evaluation, uh, the happy sheet as I call it, um, appear on your screen but it will also be on the website to to download via the link at the end. Um, these materials will all be on the, the PSHE Association's website, along with the recording of this webinar. Um, so that just leads me to say thank you, a very, very you know, big thanks to our speakers today and uh, for giving your time. And thank you to all of, of you listening in for giving your time to join us today. And um, have a good evening and, and a good rest of week. And thank you very much. Thank you.